All right, ladies, we will get ready to start this evening. If you don't have a note sheet, and many of you have um, printed off the reading guides, the note sheet is different, and in the back it's just a guide for us tonight to help me get through information that I want to share with you. Hopefully it'll expound a little bit more on some of the concepts that you read or will be reading. I know some of you do not have the book yet, and I'm so sorry about that. That's always frustrating, but when I first pulled it up, it was like, Amazon has the book, and CBD looks like it has the book, and then it was like, I guess we bought up all the copies <laughs> really fast. And then, of course, um, the Women of Hope Conference, which is this Friday and Saturday at Hope Bible Church. Um, if you're still interested in going, you can still register this week or even walk in the door on Friday or Saturday and be a part of that. It'll be at Hope Bible Church in Columbia. And um, their website for that is just W-O-H-C-O-N-F for Women of Hope Conference. Dot org, And um, if you need any more information, you can see me. But Martha Peace is their main speaker. And she was supposed to, they were supposed to do this last year. But because of COVID, obviously, it didn't happen. That's when the book came out. And so she was going to be speaking through this. She still will be. So you can get, like, the author's perspective on what she experienced if you've started reading it um, you know, as she was writing this, her daughter was going through a very scary trial with breast cancer that sounded um, just like a hard and grueling time for them. Of course, many unknowns, but um, she'll be teaching through this. Other pastor's wives that um, you're familiar with will be there doing breakout sessions on Saturday. Um, me too, so I guess you're familiar with me. But um, I think... Um, Pastor Paul's wife will be there. I don't think Jennifer Walson will be there. She was supposed to be, but um, could not. But um, it'll be a good time together. There is a group of us going, so if you are planning to go, let us know just so we can be looking for you and maybe get a table or two close together so that we can enjoy that fellowship while we're there. The other announcement that I had was last week was a conference online called the Open Hearts in a Closed World Conference. And um, you can just Google on YouTube, Open Hearts in a Closed World Conference. Their um, conference topic this year was Reverence in Radical Times. And it was really, really good. I got to listen to most of the sessions last week. And their music was led by um, City of Light, which we sing a couple of their songs here at church. And many of you enjoy listening to their praise and worship. So if you didn't get to watch it, they're all saved online. And you can watch it in the com comfort of your own home, in your favorite comfy clothes, or however you want to do that. But um, I would highly recommend it. The um, Susan Heck um, session on a spirit-filled marriage on day one was very encouraging. Um, that might be something many of you would be interested in. And then there were just other ones on discipleship and the different um, speaking to older women from the Titus II perspective, speaking to younger women from that perspective as well. So if you get a chance, check that out. And then also, um, of course, we have this is just a mini Bible study series for this summer, so I'm thankful for each of you that have wanted to participate in this. And then Women Walking Wisely will start regularly in September for our once-a-month gathering, and we'll be going through the book of 1 John together. And then um, Precepts will also be starting up with Kathy Carlisle, so be looking for information on that as it gets underway in the fall. So it's kind of fun to like see things coming back and like look, things to look forward to. So I hope that all of that has been an encouragement for you as well. But um, we're going to begin this evening, obviously, with our study in the um, precious truths in practice, holding fast to God when you are overwhelmed, and um, just really um, trying to get a better idea of the character of God and who he is. 
um, helping our minds sort of build that foundation, which is so important to begin with the character of God. And I have um, several things to say about that as we get started this evening. But let's just open with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time together. And um, we'll get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for another night that you could bring us together, that we can begin this study on just, Lord, learning more about who you are. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to have minds, to um, search out the riches of your truth, and that you have given ways, Lord, in which we can know you. And so, Father, we thank you for making that um, just something that is a grace in our lives available to us uh, sinners who um, have been redeemed by your son. Father, I thank you for the ladies that you've brought here this evening. I just pray that you will continue to grow them in the knowledge of your truth and that it will not just be head knowledge, Lord, but that it will be heart transformation that will just um, make them more godly in what they say and what they do and how they live, Lord, as they just focus on who you are, um, maturing in godliness, Lord, until the day that we get to see you face to face. Father, I thank you for this time that we have together, and we just pray now that you would be honored and glorified through it and in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So um, as we begin, I just want to, um, this is the first point on your paper is not from the book itself, but just kind of laying a foundation of why we even begin this study. Why should we begin here? And A.W. Tozer, in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, said, the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about God. He said, I'll repeat that again. The most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about God. And I think Oftentimes, as we get up in the morning and face the day ahead of us, we're not always, that's not really necessarily the first thing that crosses our mind. Like, what do I think about God today? Or how, how does that filter through my day? But really, as you, for some of you who have started going through the book, or you've been a believer for a while, and you're growing in the grace and knowledge of who God is, you can think that what you do think about God is so important because it lays a foundation for then how you filter everything else in life, right? The trials that come, the joys that come, many things then of our lives, our whole life can be filtered through what we think about God. A preacher, a current preacher, H.B. Charles said, your view of God is everything. Your view of God is everything. And again, I'm just like, how often are we thinking about what our view of God is? We love him. We know that he loves us. But do we just like stop there in that limited aspect of who he is? We don't think maybe broadly about his whole character. And when we're talking about God, every attribute, every perfection of who he is, is all-encompassing, perfect at all times. And so we tend to think often in one dimension, right? We often think of him in these lanes of him being loving, him being gracious, him being kind. And yet all of that is happening at all the time at perfected level beyond what even our minds can comprehend. Look at Jeremiah. We're going to be hopping around. So this, is, this feels different because so often we're just like in a book focused studying on that. That's what we normally do. So we're going to be hopping around a bit. But open to Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And it says, in God's word, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Our view of God is everything. Let's keep that in mind. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. 
These are the things that are important to our Lord. And how much do we know about them as it, as it is his character, as it is who he is? A right view of God is everything. Without it, you have nothing, H.B. Charles goes on to say. Only when God is put in the right perspective is everything else brought into focus. And so then that then helps us view the trials, his goodness, the grace we receive through salvation, our gratitude, which should be overwhelmingly spilling out of us, our worship, right? It all flows out of our understanding of the character and the nature of God. That's why it's so important and why when um, we were discussing this summer what book to do, I was talking with Jody and we were looking at a couple ideas and um, this book came back I think because of finding out about the conference. But as I looked at it, I was like, you know, I just really feel like this is a good place to start. And when you look at the book initially, it might seem kind of elementary or kind of surfacey because every one of these chapters are volumes of books, right? They're unlimited as far as how they could be expounded upon. And yet, the truth that she shares in here and opens our eyes to, some of it familiar, some of it new maybe, um, just again, helps us build our understanding of who God is so that our view of him can be right. Because so often we get a made up view of who God is because we see him through our human eyes, we see him through our fallen world, and we begin to describe God in ways that are really actually not helpful and not honoring to him. And not purposeful. We don't do it purposefully, but we're fallen people living in a fallen world. And so our minds can't even see clearly, right, actually who God is. And yet through his word, he has allowed us to know him. So it's one of those crazy wrestling things that you go around with. We can't know him fully but he has revealed himself to us. And so we need to make sure we understand it rightly. And so often you'll hear here or um, in other places about having, thinking rightly about God, having a right understanding of who God is, or having a high view of God. You'll hear Matt say that often from the pulpit, we want to have a high view of God. And so what does that mean? That's um, something to consider. And that's, again, what this study will help us to understand. Um, one of the things I was reading said, one of the most crucial of the realities is that we have a high view of God because we know who he is. Our God is holy. Our God is righteous. Our God is just. He is the one who defines good and bad, right and wrong, and man's purpose in the world. As believers, this high view of God compels us to be more like Christ and drives us to pursue holiness and sanctification in our lives. A high view of God is imperative because without it, we fall easily into a toleration of sin. When we don't exalt God in our worship, we jeopardize the purity of the church and dim the light God designed his body to be in the world. We unconsciously replace God with man as the focus. So if we're not having a high view of God, then we reverse it and get a high view of man where we become the filter and the measure for things. Our view should be high view of God, low view of man, right? That's, that's what our aim is, our goal. And so a church with a low view of God eventually becomes a man-centered ministry where glory, glorifying God is an afterthought. And that actually comes from, that was from Grace Community Church, from their website. Um, R.C. Sproul is quoted as saying that the doctrine of God is the most important doctrine of the Bible because the doctrine of God becomes your paradigm or your lens in which you see everything else. It affects your worldview. It affects the way you see society and culture, even politics and marriage all flow out of how you recognize and um, know the character of God, how you see trials. Our view of God either blurs things or brings things into clear focus. So having a good understanding and a right understanding of who God is 
helps us then be able to think rightly, think biblically, think soundly, which is so important for us in a world where it is so confusing and it just gets darker and more blurred every day, right? You can see that happening. J.I. Packer said the disregard, to disregard the study of God, or sorry, let me start over. He said, disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way you can waste your life and lose your soul. And so from these different writers and different people, we can see the importance of why it is that we get into the word and know who God is. Um, not just through one lane, not just through his grace or his kindness, not our favorite character trait of who God is, which is even to say characteristic or character trait seems so limited to God, right? But um, to know these attributes in all of their beauty and all of their glory as best we can is so important for us growing as godly women. So the knowledge of God, I just made a quick list and you could add to this. The knowledge of God drives our thinking. It is truth. It guards us from sin. It strengthens us. It directs our worship. It convicts us. It purifies us. It prepares us for whatever the Lord has for us next. Whatever trial it is or joy that we have to face, it prepares us. It helps us wait patiently. It grows us in godliness and holiness. It gives us hope. It helps us trust. It teaches us about love and prepares us for a future with him. And that's just, again, scratching the surface of what the knowledge of God can do in our lives and how it continues to change us and form us into the image of our Savior. So what can we know about God? That's the most basic question of theology. For what we can know about God and whether we can know anything about him at all to determine the scope and content of our study. Here we must consider the teaching of the greatest theologians in history, all of whom have affirmed that here's a theology term for you tonight to write down. It's many, many syllables. The incomprehensibility of God, okay, so incomprehensible, right? The incomprehensibility of God, that's your theology word for tonight. So what do we mean about the incomprehensibility of God? It's not the fact that we can't know him at all, that we are unable to comprehend or know him at all. But theologically speaking, it is to say that God is incomprehensible is not to say that it is utterly unknowable. It is to say that none of us can exhaustively know who God is. So that's the key there, that we can't exhaustively know who God is. We see him, again, I've already referenced it, but we're seeing him in light of human frailty, right? How does the finite, you and I, understand the infinite God, right? Can we fully comprehend infinity? No, right? It's impossible. We're finite fallen creatures. And so there is a sense in which our understanding of who God is is limited. The finite cannot contain or grasp the infinite. Deuteronomy 29:29 29, 29 says, "The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are secret things. If the Lord has secret things, what does that how else could we define that? What would be another term we could use for secret things or description of that? Hidden is the word I was thinking. Anybody else? Mysterious, sure. In, <laughs> incomprehensible comes into play, right? I'm sorry. Conceal, good. All right, so all of those things, right? The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are things about him that we will not know at this time. 
There are things that we cannot know. There are things that our minds can't even comprehend, right? There, when you think about even his character of what we do know and that he is infinite and perfect in his being, then you think there has to be things even beyond that we can't even humanly comprehend. Like, it's just beyond. It's that, he's that great and that good. But Deuteronomy 29, 29 is good to remind us that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed, the verse goes on to say, so there are things that we can know, that we're learning, that we've been learning, some of you for many, many years, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. Isn't that a comfort? There are things that we can know. There are things that we can know deeply and we can rest assuredly on those things. What a good verse to like even commit to memory as we go through this study. In heaven, God will be much more to us then than he is even now. Isn't that a thought that's just like, like your mind? It's just like hard to put it in. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 reminds us that for now we see in a mirror dimly, right? That concealed, that mystery, that unknown, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. And so 1 Corinthians 13, 12 gives us that hope of what we have to look forward to when we are with Christ, when we are with the Father, and we are there face to face. And this sort of introduces us and leads us into then chapter 1 of the book that um, many of you are reading and some of you are waiting on and that's okay but we're going to talk about the revelation of God how he has revealed himself to us Spurgeon said it is impossible that there should be a God at all except the God of revelation a God who can be fashioned by our own thoughts is no more a God than the image manufactured or produced by our own hands the true God must of necessity be his own revealer and so God himself reveals himself to us so that we can know him and um, grow in the things that he has us to know and honor him through it. So the first type of revelation that was discussed in your book, do you remember what that was, those of you who got to read? General, right? And, and some of you just might know that from past studies, but general revelation is letter A, and general is just kind of the basic low-level entry that everyone gets to experience. It's God's witness of himself through the, through the creation to his creatures. God's witness of himself through the creation to his creatures. In it, we see his glory on display, which is God's weightiness or significance that he displays. The general revelation, and I'm just going to give you some basic notes on this so you can write down what's important to you or what stands out and presses upon your heart and mind. But it's in general revelation, we get a, an appreciation for God's wisdom and power. For example... It's summer, so many of you are, have either been to the beach or you're thinking about the beach or you wish you were at the beach or you hope you get to the beach at some time. But hopefully, all of you had had the opportunity to be on the beach and look at the ocean, right? And so when the ocean waves are rolling in and out, you get the beauty of it, you get the sound of it, you hear the crashing and the power of it. That's kind of seeing God's wisdom and power on display. Right, because there's a beauty there that you can look at and just be like in awe of this thing in front of you, the vastness of the ocean, right, and the reflection of the sun and just everything around it. But then you also see the force and power on display as those waves are rolling in and rolling out and crashing, right? You see both God's wisdom and power on display, or even in a storm. You know, having little kids, little kids, not all of them like storms. So there's a very fearful side of a storm. 
And I'm like, this is so cool, right? The lightning and the thunder, and they're like in your room at 2 a.m., scared to death, not having the same experience as you. But when you, if you enjoy watching storms, then you like to see the, even the storm clouds roll in, right? It changes the look of the sky, and you think, I mean, a believer is blessed to be able to look up and see that and recognize God's handiwork on display. You think, what do people think when they look up and they're like, that's cool, something's happening. Like, you have nowhere to give the praise to, right, if you don't know God. And just seeing his hands in control of that. So, like, calming a child, it's like, who created the storm? God creates the storm. He makes everything that's good and perfect. He made this storm. He's watching over us and caring for us even through this storm. But you see his power on display, and you can see his beauty in it as well. So God's wisdom and power are on display through general revelation, and it gives us an appreciation for it. And even people that can't thank the Lord for it, there is an appreciation, right? People like to go to the beach. People like to sit there and watch. People like to watch storms. People like to see rainbows. They might not know why, but it's in their heart, right? And the Bible even tells us that that, that um, longing in their heart is from the Lord. There's an inherent knowledge of right and wrong that comes through general revelation, meaning your conscience, right? Everyone has a conscience. Again, if you're a parent, your little kids know right and wrong. That's why they're so good at being sneaky, right? That's why they can sneak in and look for the cookie when you said no, or they can do the things that you told them not, and they're still wrestling with it, right? They're, they're well, waiting till they think you're not looking to do it. Or then they take it and hide their candy up in their room until you find like all these wrappers around their bed or something like that. Because they know they're not supposed to be doing it. We all have that. Believers and unbelievers. Romans 2, 14 through 15 speak of, speak of this. If we um, go there, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So that's in Romans 2, 14 through 15, that our conscience plays a role, whether believer or unbeliever. And so God gives that to all men. It is um, general revelation is limited in what can be observed by sinful man. It points to the creator, right? It, it points that somehow this all happened here in this world. And it leaves people without excuse, but it doesn't save people on its own. And so hopefully you came away with that from your reading or you knew that as well. That general revelation gives people no excuse to recognize that there is a creator, that there is a God. It actually even says it condemns them, right? But it will not save them. You can't get saved by recognizing the sun or the trees or the ocean. Or even recognizing that there's a creator. There's more to salvation than that. Um, we can be challenged by Romans 10, 5 through 17, or 1 Corinthians 1, 18, um, through chapter 2, verse 5. In Romans 10, there are um, familiar verses, and I'll just read a couple of them that go along with, um, with this. Because when we're talking, again, that no one can be saved by general revel revelation, it's important for us to remind ourselves, how then will they call on him in who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from, you remember? Hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. 
And so salvation comes through the word, which we'll get to in the next point. But that important part that what God has revealed to us specifically in this world and in, our, in the nature that he has given us the beauty of his creation points directly to him and does demand worship and praise. But in order to know the creator, it won't save us. It won't redeem us. That comes through hearing and hearing the word of the Lord and the importance of that and um, that conviction that it should put on our hearts as we interact with others around us um, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. General revelation has been for all people, for all time, and as you notice, it's observed even by human senses, right? You don't have to have a science degree to go out to enjoy the world that God has for you, right? It's the average person. We can walk out and we can see the beauty of what God has done and be challenged in our thought of him. Psalm 19 is a wonderful psalm. Um, Martha mentioned it in her writing. And um, if you haven't had time to study that psalm, that would be uh, another place where you could camp for a little bit this summer. But Psalm 19 in the first six verses speak of general revelation. It's a revelatory psalm in that the first part of it speaks of general revelation. The ending part speaks of special revelation, which we'll get to in just a second. And then the ending part of the psalm just sort of gives us our response. Then what do we do with this um, revelation that we have from the Lord? But if you look at Psalm 19, you can see the specific things um, in the first six verses of the things of God's creation that display his glory and point to him. And so the first verses say, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so we can see general revelation displayed in God's handiwork in his creation as the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Right there in verse 1. That the sky proclaims his handiwork. It talks about day and night. They give knowledge of God. As the sun rises and sets every day and the moon comes out and somehow the sun is at the right angle to bounce off the moon and we see stars when the sky is clear. You know, like how does all that happen without a creator and God holding it all in place? The message of the created world is everywhere as seen in Psalm 19, the message is spoken without word, right? Did you catch that? It's silent, but there's a message that goes out as the sun rises and sets, as, every, as the seasons change. There's things that are happening in our world. And then it even references the sun compared to the bridegroom or a runner and rising and the circuit and its heat just all happening by chance. It just sort of, boom, happened somehow. Some rocks collided and we got all this. Like, that doesn't even make sense, right? Logically, like, not at all. And yet, we have a God who created it all and who holds it all and demands worship of us because of what he has done. And we can know him, but we can't be saved through it. It's not going to bring us salvation and so that's when the second part is so important, letter B, special revelation. If you've read about that and understand that, the definition there, God uses special revelation when he reveals himself directly and in greater detail. For us, it is seen only through his word, through the Bible. It's only in his word, God's word. We're not receiving special revelation 
Matt does not get special revelation on Saturday night from God, praise the Lord. It's all through his word, right? That's where we get it. But at one time, God did speak. And so, number one there, he directly spoke through dreams and visions as seen in the Old Testament specifically, but not limited to that. It also occurred in the New Testament. Um, you can think of times when he, right, he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and spoke directly to them. He spoke directly through dreams and visions, and even in those conversations, he spoke to Daniel and Isaiah and the prophets. He spoke to John on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation. And we're not having that happen today. The book is complete, and so we have everything we need recorded in his word but that did happen so that we can have his word with us now and so those things were important as he imparted that to um, those special people that were chosen at that time number two ultimately we see him directly revealing himself through the incarnation of his son jesus christ as Colossians states that he was and is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. You can also see Hebrews 1.3. We have the Gospels that give the account of his life here on earth. In John 14, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the, do you remember what it says? The Father, right? How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And so he was continually putting himself on display. And we know that well as we're going through Mark, right? And seeing the Lord um, reveal himself to his slow disciples as they were in getting it. But how many of us would be in the same place needing those gentle reminders from Jesus himself? And so through his son, he has revealed himself. And then for us today, number three, the important thing that we have is the Bible, his holy word, his word given to us. It is a fi fixed written testimony from the creator to his creatures. Fixed and written. Fixed as in it's finished, unchanging. Okay, that, in, that is important. Composed over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different human authors. It's more than the words of men, but the inspired words of God himself. The Bible reveals the mind of God, the ways of God, the righteousness of God and the means by which man may please God. It is superior to general revelation because it is specific and verbal. It is written by his apostles and prophets, and it is a lasting and forever settled witness to an unchanging God, which is important. His, these words cannot be changed, and when someone does, right, that's when it gets scary. Because it does happen, right? And then false teaching and, and false things creep into our world and have for centuries and lead people astray. But this word is lasting and forever settled witness to an unchanging God. And so then in Psalm 19, we then can see special revelation. Why do I keep wanting to add extra syllables to that word? But... Um, in special revelation, we can see in Psalm 19, then God displays and puts his perfect word on display for us to see it in its beauty. We can see in um, these verses, verses 7 through 11, but specifically verses 7 through 9, we see the word described in multiple ways, and we see how it is described, what it is, and then what it does. And that's what God's word does to us. And I was um, just even thinking, like reading over the next chapter that we're going to talk about briefly, the goodness of God. 
just reading through those verses from like Psalms as they're listed out there, just how refreshing it is just to see God's goodness on display and how that really does revive the soul and is just such a peaceful and um, just all these things right here that we, we're going to go over right now. So in verse 7, it says that the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord is what? If you're in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect. So the word that's used there is the law of the Lord. It can be called that. It is perfect. And then what does it do? Revives the soul, right? And how, how often do we need to be revived, right? I, I think I need it every morning. <laughs> and probably I needed it at 7 this evening. Like, you know, throughout the day, reviving the soul is so important. The next one is the testimony of the Lord. The testimony of the Lord. And how do we see the testimony of the Lord? How is it described here? It's sure. It's sure. And it makes wise the simple. It makes wise the simple. It takes the simple things, like you and me, and makes us wise in a world where people are esteemed with accolades, right? And, and we may have accolades in this room, but for the most part, we're, I just think of us as simple people, right? But it makes us wise because we have a sure thing to go through. We have a sure thing to focus on. We have a sure thing that we can then filter the things of this life through that we were talking about at the beginning. Why it's so important to understand God. So we have a foundation in which we can filter things through. We have that lens that can help us think rightly. So we have the law of the Lord is perfect. We have the testimony of the Lord is sure. In verse 8, it says, the precepts of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord. And that's, again, just an, another word for his word, the precepts of the Lord. And what are they? The precepts of the Lord are right. Good. Right. And your versions may say, say slightly different terms, but all meaning and pointing to the same thing. The precepts of the Lord are right, and that makes for a rejoicing heart, right? That makes for the joy that we are to have. Rejoice in the Lord always, right? Well, we obviously need his word to be able to rejoice in the Lord always because we're not always feeling that, right? If, if our feelings were to drive us all the time, we wouldn't be rejoicing very often probably, and so we need his word to correct our thinking so that we can respond rightly and have a rejoicing heart. The next one that we see in verse 8 is the commandment of the Lord. And the commandment of the Lord is, is not doing things to hurt us or to harm us or to control us in like a dictatorship power. It's described as what kind of way right here that we see it in verse 8 is pure. Pure, okay? Pure. Something that is pure and unaffected, right? It's unblemished or stained. It's right and good. The commandment of the Lord is pure, and that enlightens our eyes, ladies. That helps us to be able, again, to see things clearly, to see things in the right perspective, to see things in a godly way that honors the Lord. And then in verse 9, we see the fear of the Lord, which isn't always a term that we think of like for God's word, but in order to know the fear of the Lord, where are we going to glean that? From his word. So it works together in that. In the fear of the Lord, and that's described as being clean in that it endures forever. So the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And then the last one in that verse says, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The rules of the Lord are true. And we need truthful things in our world that are right and that guide us in the right way. And so as a result of that, 
it keeps us from sin. It convicts us and helps us to keep short accounts in our own lives. It keeps our minds focused in the right way because it is for God's glory. And um, even at the end of chapter 19 here in Psalms, verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And it all flows out of what he has revealed to us, what we can know about who he is. And then how do we respond to that? In what way are we going to respond? So in general and special revelation, we can see some of the things that will happen. Where general revelation, because it's dealing with the things of creation and the things outside us in the nature and our world, that those things will pass away, right? You know that our world, as we know it, will one day be no more. That will pass away. It will perish. But the word of the Lord, according to the Bible itself, says it will endure forever, right? The word endures. So general revelation, it will pass away. There will come an end, but the word endures. The means of general revelation in nature is cursed and in bondage to corruption, right? Because of the fall our fallen world, even even all creation groans, right? The Bible talks about. However, the word is inspired by God and is always perfect and holy. It This book in of itself isn't corrupted by the fall. It's perfect in all of its ways because it is a reflection of God. And general revelation is limited in scope when compared to the multidimensional expanse of special revelation. And as we already said, what we're meaning by that, general revelation only condemns, but special revelation condemns and redeems. So you're, the word of God will convict, but it also will draw people to the Lord himself, right? It's the kindness as described in Romans that leads us to repentance, right? It happens in the word. Unfortunately, general revelation only makes us aware that there is a creator out there for those who are willing to go beyond their heart and heart even to that point to see. And so that's just a little overview of general and special revelation. There's more that she has in her book that you can keep reading on and gleaning from and verses to dig into. But we also looked at chapter 2, the goodness of God. And in the goodness of God, in chapter 2, we can see the word, um, Martha talks about the word doctrine. She talks about the goodness of God as a doctrine of God. And doctrine just means teaching. So doctrine just means a teaching of God, teaching about the goodness of God. And so we're going to talk about attributes a lot in this um, book as we look at the different, I don't even want to say parts because they're not parts, but the, of the character of who God is. So attributes means to describe the indescribable. That's what we're doing with these attributes of God. We're describing the indescribable. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscru inscrutable his ways. <clears throat> and then you can also see Isaiah 40.28 to talk about the vastness of who God is. The attributes of God are his characteristics, the, very at the various aspects of his essence or nature. Sometimes you might read in a commentary or someone else's writings, they might call them his perfections. Attributes are also referred to as perfections, as based on 1 Peter 2.9, that talks about knowing the excellencies of who God is. The characteristics of God are each perfect and inherently characterize the God who is perfect. And that 1 Peter 
verse talks, it's the verse that talks about that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies, the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God's perfections are the essential characteristics of his nature. Because these characteristics are necessary to his nature, all his attributes are absolutely perfect and thus rightly called perfections. Further, since these perfections are essential to God's nature, if any one of them were denied, God would no longer be God. And so we have to see them all, and we have to see them rightly. Believing that, this is something that Martha Peace said, believing that God is good is necessary in order for us to embrace a right view of God and of ourselves, to be able to help others and to honor God through difficult times. She even goes on to say that God's goodness was a precious truth she clung to when overwhelmed with fear. And she describes that in her book. So the goodness of God, the goodness of God is good because it's who he is, right? It is his character. It is his attribute. It is his essence. It's not because of what he's done for us that he is good. He is good, right? We are characterized by goodness when we act, behave, speak, serve in a certain way. He is good. He is good. God's goodness is that he is, and this I think is your number one on your paper, God's goodness is that he is the perfect sum. He is perfect. He is the perfect sum, source, and standard for himself and his creatures of that which is wholesome, which is related to well-being, virtuous, beneficial, and beautiful. God's goodness cannot be separated from his other attributes. You cannot see his attributes in isolation. There is a connection with his goodness and his holiness. There is a connection with his goodness and justice. He can't be good and not be just. And he can't be good and just and not also have divine and perfect wrath either. So we can't just see him as what we define good as. It's, again, that multidimensional view of who God is that our limited minds tend to focus in on one thing of what we say is good. And then, again, that's where we fall into trouble. We have to back up and see him for who he is in his greatness and his glory and his power, his divine self, and see him not as an isolated one dimension, but as multi-dimension. So in his benevolence, he shows loving kindness, right? It rains on the just and the unjust. That's goodness of God. He has holy love for his people through salvation. He shows mercy. All of that flows in his goodness, and yet all of those could be individual attributes of who he is because of his perfection. The goodness of God is also visible in scripture, which is, again, where we're going to know him from. There is no one good except who? God, right? That's, that's the easy answer. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone in Mark 10. And then you can also see it repeated in the account in Luke 18, 19. And it's also um, <clears throat> the same kind of phraseology as used in Matthew 5, 48. All creatures are to praise God for his goodness. You see that you can think of the Psalms, right? That refer to his goodness. And even Psalms that we had in our book in chapter 2. Psalm 106, 1, Psalm 107, 1, Psalm 118, 1, Psalm 136, 1. You can sort of see the theme of the psalmists who were writing there that the first verse gives praise for his goodness. And in Jeremiah 33, 11. <clears throat> and that's just a few. And then the goodness of God that's visible in Scripture urges us to trust in the Lord and discover that he is good. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is the absolute good. He is the absolute good. 
He can't be pleased with anything short of absolute perfection, his holiness. In a sense, his pleasure is in himself, right? He did not create us to complete him, right? He did not create us as a something that of his need, right? He needs nothing. He is, it's called aseity, like a, another theological term for you, that he has everything that he needs within himself, self-sufficient, right? And so he does not need us to bring him pleasure. And yet in his goodness, we can bring him honor and glory. He is the absolute perfect good. Psalm 34 um, spending a little time in Psalm tonight. But Psalm 34 is just a um, good reminder. I've already referenced Psalm 34, 8 about, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. But sometimes as we're going through life and as you even see in the little byline heading of this, holding fast to God when you are overwhelmed, Right? We need to be reminded of scriptures that we can go to, that we can fill our minds with, that we can, again, have it revive and refresh us. And Psalm 34 is one of those ones where you could spend time studying again this summer when you have time and you, you want to put your mind on something good and grow in the goodness of God. But in this psalm, it's an acrostic poem, 22 verses. If we were reading Hebrew, we'd be able to see it. If we knew Hebrew, we'd be able to understand it even better. But it is an acrostic poem. And this was one that followed uh, our ladies' Bible study, went through 1 Samuel the other year. And this is one where David um, was fleeing always from Saul, right? And he ends up running to the Philistine land and ends up in Gath. And he had just um, been at Nob, where the priests were, and the, he asked the priests for bread, and they gave him the sword of Goliath of Gath, remember? And then David goes to Gath and shows up there, and the king, he has this confrontation, and David acts like a madman, goes crazy in front of them, like the Bible describes him with drool spittle on his beard. And so the... The king sees him and is like, uh, this is the man who slays the ten thousands. I have enough crazy men here. Get him out of here. And, and David does get away from him. And he hides out in the caves of Adullam. And um, many of David's band show up. Like, not the cream of the crop. Like the way the group, the band of merry men that show up with him. But while he's there, he writes this Psalm 34. So that's what it comes out of. So when you think of where he's been, you can go to 1 Samuel 21 and 22 to get an overview of that um, short little history lesson that I just gave you, 1 Samuel 21 and 22. But he was always on the run, always fleeing. And so you know he wasn't like just sitting on the beach, relaxing, as we've discussed earlier this evening. But in um, tense-filled times, right? To the point of pushing him to act like a crazy man in front of a king of another land. And so when David goes before the Lord in Psalm 34, you can get a better idea of him blessing and thanking the Lord for getting him out of that situation in which he found himself and seeing the goodness of, of the Lord amidst the trials that he was in. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He's definitely come back to a right frame of mind. And so the goodness of God, we can see, demands praise. The goodness of God demands praise for us at all times, not just when we're at church, not just at times when we're in worship in our quiet time, but at all times, even the difficult times. <clears throat> the goodness of God promotes trust in him. 
I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from one of my fears, right? No, all of his fears, all of his fears, that's all-encompassing, right? That's, that is a comfort for us to go back to and see that there's faith even amidst the fear. The goodness of God promotes trust in him. If you keep reading through verse 7, you can see also that he looks to the Lord and that he cried to the Lord and that the Lord heard him and delivered him. In verses 8 to 10, the goodness of God can be known, that we can taste and see. That's a very personal thing, right? No one can taste something for you and you get that experience. The same as seeing something, right? Someone can describe it to you, but when you see it with your own eyes, it takes on a whole different meaning. The goodness of God can be known. We can taste and we can see. It's personal. And those that fear the Lord, in verse 10, what does it say? Those who fear the Lord at the end of verse 10, how does that end? They lack no good thing. They lack no good thing. It might not be what you wanted, right? But you will lack no good thing. So the goodness of God can be known. The goodness of God teaches us what is good. If you look at verses 11 through 14, come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And then he goes on to explain, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit, turn away from evil and do good, do good, seek peace and pursue it. So the goodness of God directs us in what is good. The goodness of God delivers and ministers to the needs of the righteous. In verses 15 through 18, the Lord is for his people. He hears and delivers. It may not be in the timeline we want it. A lot of time is filled with waiting, but he hears and delivers. He is near and he saves. Those who face difficult times, such as trials, those who are, even the words that he used, those who are brokenhearted and the crushed in spirit, the Lord delivers and ministers to the needs of those who are his. And at the end of chapter um, 34 here in verses 19 through 22, we see that the Lord redeems his own, that there is salvation for those who he has called out. None of us who take refuge in him will be condemned. We have salvation. The Lord's redeem, or the Lord redeems the life of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Verse 22. The Lord is good. And your book has much more to say on that, many things to say on it, many principles. If you were a close reader in chapter two, I'm sorry, but um, I think it was page 18, it taught, for some reason, it said at the bottom that there were 12 basic principles, and then she lists out nine. I'm sorry about that. If you were bothered like me, I had to get over it. I hope you got over it too. Um, but um, there are nine principles. I tried to count it up many different ways, and I'm like, it's still only nine. And so um, that was there. So we might find some of these. I'm guessing this is first print, and so somehow that made it, did, made it through the edit without going checked. But um, there's much more to say about the revelation of God. There's much more to say about the goodness of God. If you have a MacArthur Study Bible specifically, in the, I meant to bring it tonight, but in the back of the MacArthur books, it does break down um, different points of doctrine and theology. And so the goodness of God is listed there with many references that you can cross-reference and check. Jody has hers if anybody wants to. <laughs> So um, that will be a good resource as you go through the book and just um, look at the many different attributes, the perfections of God that we will look at. During this study, our basic time is going to be from 7.30 to 8.30, hopefully. When we do three chapters, it'll be a little more crunchy, but we'll do our best. But at the end, I would like to leave time for us to have a little discussion since we're all reading from the same book. If there are um, highlights or key things that stood out to you, and we'll try to 
break up in smaller groups and we can move around this room to do that. I know not all of you had the book for tonight and haven't got to read it yet, but after the teaching and through some basic thought and understanding, hopefully there can be some conversation to flow as we all continue to grow in these things. So um, I'm thinking this evening we'll just do a quick few minutes of that.